Good afternoon. Welcome to our September statewide webinar. I'm Yonika Bennett, the Executive Director of the New York Charter School Association. I'm joined today by Anna Hall, CEO, Northeast Charter School Network, Janet Klein, Associate in Education Research at NYSED, Catherine Connell Espinoza, Interim Executive Director of the SUNY Charter School Institute, Lori Hazley, Senior Director, Charter Authorizing and Accountability Team at the New York City DOE, and Corey Callahan, General Counsel and VP of Legal Policy at the New York City Charter School Center. As we begin today, let's start by giving well wishes to those who celebrated the high holidays and the new year this, these past two weeks and wish everyone a happy National Hispanic Heritage Month. As you know, October is also Mental Health Awareness Month and uh, schools are sure are marking these um, events with um, different activities in a variety of ways. The association will be hosting um, the Bronx Charter School community uh, meeting tomorrow with a conversation with students and on, oh, excuse me, with the students on mental health and wellness and a panel of experts. Now we have a few updates from the association. We'll begin before we hear from our authorizer and guests. Authorizer and guests. Yeah. Next week, we'll be convening in Buffalo, as you all know, for the New York Charter Schools Conference. We're thrilled to welcome charter school leaders, allies, and stakeholders from across the state for three days of breakout sessions, speakers, community visits, and a course celebration. The full conference agenda is now available to view. We're dropping a link in the chat to view the schedule and to register if you haven't already. Please do so right now. We'd love to see you. For those of you who have already registered, we can't wait to see you there. Please keep an eye in the meantime in your inboxes for more information on conference logistics and any off-site tours or after parties that you have registered for. If you have any questions about the conference, please reach out to us at conference at nycharters.net. With student loan forgiveness in the news recently, we want you to know that the public service loan forgiveness waiver period closes at the end of this month. There is a lot of information available. There's an upcoming public service web, excuse me, public webinar on the PSLF program. We're dropping a link to the flyer in the chat. Please don't miss that. The November midterm elections are less than a month away. Let's work together to register voters by the October 14th deadline this week. The association has two more virtual vote, voter registration sessions on October 11th and 13th. These 30 minute sessions are open to all and are great for your 16 to 18 year old high school students, as well as any staff or family members that need to register. Please see the link in the chat to share the registration information. The association member schools can arrange a customized in-person or vote virtual voter registration session by contacting Natasha Cherry Perez at the email we're putting in the chat. The next legislative session will be here before we know it, and the charter community is heading to Albany for Advocacy Day on January 31st. Parents at your school can stay informed and get prepared by joining our parent council and our parent training series. It's important for families to be prepared to advocate for their great charter schools. The New York State Charter Parent Council's next meeting will be held tomorrow, Wednesday, October 12th at 6 p.m. Our next Parent Council training session will be on New York State school funding, and that will be October 27th at 6 p.m. All are welcome to attend. Please share the flyers. This will be in English and Spanish, and we're placing them in the chat. Please share them with your families and your family liaison. The association's working groups continue, of course, in October. We have our two uh, working groups that will meet uh, the final week of October. We're excited to bring together data managers and operation leaders for these sessions. Links to, the to, links to register for the session are being brought to the chat. Our next data working group uh, will be on Tuesday, October 25th at 10 a.m. Our next operation, operations working group uh, will meet Friday, October 28th at 10 a.m. Uh, the meeting will, uh, for the working group will focus on using data to improve school bus transportation. We will be joined by John Thatcher, Chief Operating Officer, and, Je and Julia McMillan, Senior Director of School Support at TIP Capital Region, who will share their experience and best practices for addressing transportation dilemmas. I have to say hello, a big shout out to John Thatcher, who was, of course, uh, formerly on our team. So, hey, John, we'll be all be listening for that. Our first Critical Friends visit kicks off Friday, October 14th. 
with a virtual visit to Renaissance Charter School in Queens, focusing on supporting student academic achievement on AP exams. We welcome any school leaders to join us for our visits. During a critical friends visit, a host school welcomes school leaders from other schools across the state to address the specific problem of practice, practice, problem of practice through a structured solutions generation, solutions generation protocol. To participate in our upcoming visit or join future visits, please complete the form at being dropped in the chat. Those are updates. Now I'll turn it over to Janet, Catherine, Corey, and Lori for any updates they would like to share. Hi, Janet. Hi, Amika. Thank you so much. Um, but I have terrific news for everyone. Um, our new director in the Charter School Office, Dr. Lisa Long, will be delivering SED's updates. And here's Lisa. Thank you, Janet. Uh, first, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And let me apologize for missing the last meeting. I was traveling from Albany and anticipated that I would be able to join, but it didn't work out. And thanks to Dr. Klein for representing the charter school office in my absence uh, last time. Also, I'd like to thank all of you who, rep, uh, who sent representatives to last month's best practices data reporting webinar. There were over 70 of you. And if you missed it, I will drop the link in the chat right now. Uh, to everyone. Okay. That now you do have the I'm trying to multitask here. All right, you should have the link there. Um, to, to the webinar if you happen to miss it. Um, in terms of reminders, we would like to uh, remind you of the importance of beginning your reporting early and checking for accuracy. And we invite you to attend the next webinar uh, for which Michael will provide the date and time uh, a little bit later. Uh, most of you probably are aware that the BEDS, uh, BEDS Day for the Institutional Master File um, application has opened. It opened on Wednesday, October 5th, and you must submit by Friday, November 18th. So please put that on your calendar if it's not already. Uh, in turn, we have the ESSA Fiscal Transparency Report uh, in IDEX on the business portal, and that will be open on November 1st with a due date of December 31st. And I'm told that this is rel a relatively painless report that takes um, a half hour or less with almost all the figures taken directly from the annual audited financial statement. So we urge you to, to complete that during those, that window. Uh, lastly, I would like to remind all of the Board of Regents authorized charters that if you have proposed material changes uh, to your charter, uh, those must be submitted to the Charter School Office portal no later than December 1st. And, and those revisions should be uh, revisions that you would like to implement in the next academic year. And finally, I would like to say hello to a few familiar names that I see. Uh, Karen Dresner's face popped up and I saw Ron Tabano's name and I'm sure I'm missing some others, but it's, it's uh, very nice to see people who I started um, my career at the department with and when we were authorizing um, separately in New York City and then also in uh, Albany for rest of state. And it's just really heartwarming to see that some of you have, you know, committed for the long haul and have been uh, supporting this work for so many years. And I look forward to seeing you in person and not just virtually. That's it for me. All right, great, thank you. Well, I love that the surprise pop up. I love that. Nice, well done, FED. Good to see you. Uh, leave the love. Um, so we're going to go to Catherine now. Hi, Catherine. Thanks, Yumika. 
And good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here. I just have a few quick reporting reminders for SUNY authorized schools. Um, please remember that annual audits are due by November 1st, and the Q1 financial reporting is due November 15th. Both submissions will be um, provided via Epicenter, and if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to folks on the finance team. Um, and then one other request for updated information. I just want to rem, you know remind everybody that it's so important that we know, that the institute knows who to reach out to in case of questions um, re, uh, regarding epicenter submissions be, being assigned to the right people and ensuring that we remove or change any contacts due to departures or position changes. Um, so we, while we know that schools submit an updated contact list each fall via Epicenter, uh, please be sure to inform the Institute throughout the year of any additional contacts who do need to be added, removed, or updated. Um, if, if you would like a, to review a full list of who the Institute currently has as contacts um, and active Epicenter users and Epicenter for your school, you are welcome to reach out to us. Um, and I'm just going to put the Epicenter uh, email in the chat. Um, other than that, I will look forward to seeing many of you in person next week at the conference. And that's all from me, Yomika. Okay, great, thank you. Hi, Lori, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Doing well, good to see you again. Thank you so much, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here with everyone this afternoon. Um, I have two uh, quick updates. So first for DOE authorized schools, the first reporting deadline was, is, uh, today, October 11th. So please make sure you have submitted all of your documents that are due um, for this first uh, reporting um, deadline today. The next deadline is November 1st, and that deadline includes any schools that wish to submit a request for a material revision. So that's November 1st. Um, and then for a, a reminder from our ops team for all charter schools about the NICETEL, right? So NICETEL eligible students should have been administered the test within 10 days of enrollment and that's 20 days for um, incoming students that have IEPs. And so just a quick reminder, the general eligibility criteria for NICETEL, their home language is other than English or unknown in ATS. Um, your language uh, team there at your school, however that is defined, has determined that the student has English language acquisition needs or if they are newly enrolled in New York City schools, right, district or charter, but not just simply new to your school or your network, right? Or lastly, if they're returning to New York City, a New York City school after being away for two or more years. So that's just a quick reminder about NICETEL um, administration. And that's all, that's all I have for reminders. And I just have a quick one. We do have our monthly call with the New York City Department of Ed and Department of Health. Um, I'll put it in the chat if folks have registered. So just, you know, if you have questions, particularly um, for Erin, um, since she couldn't make it today, I know, you know, there, there are often data questions that pop up. So folks should, you know, if you have questions, we can, we can handle them on Friday. And that's all for me, Yumika. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, now we'll open it up for any questions. Um, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself or put your question in the chat. We'll open it up. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. Um, We'll give it one more second. We'll do the last call, as it were. Stacy oh, had one in in the in the comments. <laughs> thank, okay. you. thank you. Okay, she says uh, thanks to Janet <laughs> for help with the enrollment target data. And can we share the link where these are and where the enrollment target retention numbers are? Janet, can you help with that one? Sure, not a problem. Um, Stacy, I'm not sure what link you're referring to. We we don't actually have a link to targets. Uh, 
I'd happy to discuss it with you offline, if that would help. Sure, that would probably help because I know that for our annual report, we have to report on um, how we're meeting the enrollment targets and the enrollment retention for um, students with IEPs, Ls, and free and reduced. I'm sure other people have that too. And we could just never figure out where to find all this. So. Well, for Board of Regents schools, we provide that information directly to the schools. And one of your schools is a Board of Regents authorized school, and the other one is not. Is that correct? Yes, but we and we have that same goal though for the chancellor authorized or chancellor recommended school as well. So we do need it for both schools. All right, well, we'll see what we can do. And um, if you just shoot me an email, we'll again, see what we can do for you. Will do, thank you. You're more than welcome. And there's another question. What time is the meeting on Friday? If this is the this Department meeting. of Health DOE meeting, it's at 1 p.m. There's another question about like school assessments on um, uh, where will we see that? Yeah, hi, Amika. It's, it's Andrea. Hi, everybody. Um, I was just, once the embargo was lifted, and I, my understanding was that I'd be able to go on everyone's report card and see how the school, other schools did on the New York State assessments last year. But when I go onto report cards and I look at 21 22, everybody who's reads no data available. Is there another report that I should be looking for to see how we, I know obviously what our scores are, but to be able to compare us to other schools, where would I find that? So uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, the, the full data isn't available yet. That's correct. So you won't be able to see that until it's released and, and it's not been released yet. You can see your data, but you can't see everyone else's. Uh, okay. But you can go, so that's why. Do we know, is there a timeline for when we'll be able to see others? I'm not aware of a timeline at this point, um, but I would imagine it would be soon. I think we did cover all of the questions now. Um, if you have more questions, just raise your hand real quick. If not, we'll move on to the next part of today's webinar. Okay, seeing none. I am excited to once again showcase, um, have the opportunity for schools to be showcased uh, on the webinars. So we have two schools that will share us an update uh, with us on the academic and operational goals that they're prioritizing for this year. I'm gonna turn this back over to Lori who's going to introduce the school. Hi, Lori. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm really excited uh, to be introducing two schools today. So first we'll have uh, Melissa Alston, the Managing Director of Operations and Malik Russell, Executive Director at Nuasen Next Generation Charter School in the Bronx. So Nuasen was founded in 2009 and is now a K-12 school with a strong history and presence in the hybrid section of the Bronx. At Nuasen, the entire team believes in the unlimited talent and intellectual potential, potential of their scholars and community. The school works to cultivate the talent and intellectual potential of their community through a progressive education that focuses on deep exploration, thoughtful questioning, and relentless curiosity and critical thinking. Uh, Nuasen has an unyielding commitment to cultivating their scholars' innate intellectual talents so their graduates can go on to achieve excellence in their post-secondary paths and make positive impacts on the broader community. At Nuasen, they believe that every single scholar has the potential to be great and change the world, and that it is their obligation to prepare their scholars for that opportunity. So I'm pleased to um, please join me in welcoming Malik Russell and Melissa Austin. Thank you both. 
Thank you. Appreciate that, Laurie. Appreciate that. Thanks um, for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak with you today and just talk a little bit about what we are, who we are, um, as well as kind of how we've kind of made our priorities and goals for this year. And so uh, Laura talked a little bit about it, um, who we are um, is, is the following. So this is our new school. Uh, we had went from a national CMO to an independent uh, charter um, within the last two years and kind of really wanted to make sure that we were very specific to the neighborhood we serve, and the community we serve, and we're trying to be very thoughtful about it. And so this is our beautiful building. And the next slide. And as we said before, uh, K through 12, 99% um, diverse population basically have a two cohort, about 26 per students, all the way in K through 12. Um, and this is uh, the rest of the numbers of our demographics. And so I know we're talking about goals here, but one thing that we really try to do is uh, what Laurie was talking about is our mission. And at the beginning of every meeting, we start with our mission um, to make sure that we're always rooted in the why of what we do. And it really is important for us to understand within our mission that we don't feel that we are um, bringing something or colonizing our area, but more importantly, uh, just giving a platform for the great talent and great community and great families and scholars in our community. And to service that, that mission, um, which Lori kind of read when she did the description of us, we kind of start with three pillars. And these three pillars are our guiding light. And as we set goals, we wanna make sure that we are purposely always thinking about those three pillars. And our three pillars kind of shortly um, are rigor, self-advocacy, and community. And you know, rigor not in a self kind of inflexible sense, but more because we just know our students are so, so talented and have so much knowledge and so much curiosity that for us to truly serve them, we need to start there. And then self-advocacy, making sure that they believe that not only they have the privilege or entitlement to advocate for themselves, but it's their obligation to advocate for themselves and their perspectives, because we need to see who they are in this world, especially during times like now, needs to see that. Um, additionally, and um, foundationally, is community. Um, we really do believe that, you know, every single member of the community deserves to be seen, loved, and heard and also has an obligation to see, love, and hear everyone else. And that we must understand that our community is a two-way space and we do that. And so during this time, the reason why I'm talking about this is because we try to root our um, goals and priorities in these pillars to make sure that we're consistently always keeping our kind of North Star in the right direction. Next slide. And so for this year, um, after last year, we kind of came up with kind of three different priority levels. Um, at the end of the school year, we kind of met as a leadership team, uh, Melissa, myself, the principals, also just kind of really thinking about what's important to us. What do we think would be the highest leverage areas for us to change? And so the things that we want to do is really make sure we push intellectual ex excellence, not just for a state test, not just, for, but just true critical thinking at the highest level and that every class, every moment was spent in, 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 in service of that. And then the second was, we want to make sure that we really started utilizing data. And data is just information. It doesn't mean data can be test scores, data can be formative, data can be all sorts of different things. Data can be how many smiles are there in the room, right? We want to make sure that we're utilizing this and not utilize as an outcome, but utilize it to help us guide which way we're going, right? And so like utilizing data and really making sure we're tracking it and communicating it to all of our constituencies to the teachers, to leaders, to parents, and to students as we part, part of that self-advocacy. And then one thing we definitely noted at the last year was we need to really focus on the whole plot, child, right? Like coming out of the pandemic, we knew that this was something that we had to really get right and make sure it was at the basis of what we do. Because no matter what we are trying to do, if we aren't really acknowledging the entire child, um, social emotional, their wants, their dislikes, their experiences, we need to really do that. And we want to really make sure that we are proactive and not responsive in that space. And so these are the priorities that we came from. And then from this, we kind of thought about what our academic goals were. We had an opportunity to see our state tests and we felt that we had made some, some really big moves in the past year 
but really felt we could do more this year. And so with that, we kind of took our data, thought about if we actually achieved those priorities, what the outcomes we would expect to have for this year, right? And so for the ELA and state math test for three through eight, we, we looked at a 60% um, an average of 60% above uh, proficiency. And then at least two of our grades, we wanted above 80%. And that was based on some of the data that we had received. And then for the entire school, an average of 70%. And again, this is not our guiding light. This is just some of the outcomes we feel that we should be able to see if we are getting it right. Um, and then in the high school, we wanted a 90% pass rate and then 70% of our scholars above 80%. And then one thing that we thought was foundational that we started doing well last year that we wanted to continue was reading, right? Like, you know, from when we were all younger, reading is fundamental. We all heard it over and over again. And so really making sure that our students had a love of reading and that we were really pushing independent reading as well. And so another goal for us was 90% of our scholars reading independently at least 30 minutes per night. That's outside of their homework space, right? Also with that is incorporated independent reading time in the school hours as well. And so we felt like this was kind of, you know, our thought process for this year that will help us drive towards excellence um, as we kind of went through this, this school year. And then the next one would be, um, the next portion was, you know, from an operational standpoint, we want to make sure that we were getting a community connection, um, really focusing and making sure that we hit enrollment and getting positive surveys. And we're also getting a return on investment, which means that we are meeting our uh, meeting or below our annual bulk budget, and also thinking about our investments and resources and whether we were getting outcome for our students. And then, last and certainly not least, making sure that we really come out of the pandemic really push for parent engagement. Um, and so that was going to be seen through surveys as well as participation, in both optional and mandatory family events. And so this was our thought process in our goal setting, and I appreciate um, this platform to discuss it. Thanks so much, Malik. Really appreciate it. I'm really excited to, to see um, to see your progress this year and come see if I can come out and visit you all at some point this year after after renewal visits I've done. All right. So let's see. So next, I'm excited to introduce Amanda Husa, the principal of Equality Charter Middle School. Founded in 2009, Equality Charter School currently serves 630 scholars in grades 6 through 12. The middle school is co-located on the PS160X campus in the co-op city section of the Bronx. The high school is currently located in private space in the Castle Hill section of the Bronx. The school is excited for the fall 2024 opening of their elementary school and bringing all of their schools into District 11 as the high school relocates to a new elementary slash high school building in the fall of 2025. Equality is committed to serving a diverse population of learners with a focus on special populations, including 25% of their scholars um, that have currently have IEPs and 10% of their scholars that are currently English language learners. So Amanda, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Ms. Uza. Thank you, Laurie. I appreciate it. Let me just uh, share my screen. You can like scholars thumbs up if you can see my screen. Awesome. Um, so um, I've had the wonderful opportunity to be the middle school principal at Equality Charter School um, for nine years now, um, having the opportunity to come into the school community in its second year of existence. Um, since then, we've had a couple of milestones. Um, so here's a timeline of Equality. Um, our doors first opened up, as Lori mentioned, in, 20, in 2009. Um, in 2014, we opened up our high school campus, serving 360 scholars in addition to our 270 at our middle school. Um, in 2020, right before the pandemic hit, we were approved to open up elementary school. Um, so that sort of took us for a whirlwind. We literally had enough time to celebrate and then close down um, because of the pandemic. Um, in 2022, uh, we started building our elementary high school campus. Um, that is going to be, um, again, moving our high school out of District 8 into District 11. 
Um, and then in the fall of 2024, we will open up our elementary school with grades K through one. I will actually be moving down as the founding elementary school principal. That's where I had my start. Um, and we will be um, uh, replacing uh, myself as well as our high school principal as he will be moving into a chief school's operator role. So we're really excited about um, the opportunity that expansion provides all of us who have been with the organization for a while, um, but also um, all of our uh, newer team members um, who now have opportunities for growth as well. Um, in 2025, our high school will come back over um, to our new campus. Um, and so uh, we'll be all together again. And then in 2027, we will be at full expansion serving over a thousand scholars in grades K through 12 um, and be one of the largest independent charters in New York City. Um, and so we are really excited about that um, and really thinking intentionally about the level of responsibility um, that that has for each of us as internal stakeholders, um, but also for our school community and the communities of the Bronx that we serve. A little bit about our scholar demographics. Um, um, so you can see here um, the scholar makeup. Um, and we are really excited about the fact that our school has always had um, uh, preference and priority for working with students with disabilities. Um, I remember when I first came to the school, I was one of only two co-taught um, classrooms. Um, and now uh, with uh, the work that we've done around our students with disabilities and, and um, you know, increasing enrollment, but also increasing um, the level of support that we can provide um, to those scholars, um, we have sort of become known um, for supporting um, those groups. Um, and so we're really excited by the way in which it supports our teachers to grow um, and become better practitioners of their craft, um, helps, uh, helps our scholars um, to become more tolerant of differences um, that they see within their school community, but also the community at large. Um, and then uh, providing that support also for our English language learners. Um, our current high school graduation rates, we've always been really proud of. Right now, again, we're a six um, through 12, expanding to a K uh, through 12, starting the fall of 2024. Um, but just uh, this past uh, cohort 2018 um, for the June 2022 uh, results had us at 87% um, graduation rate. Um, and so that's something that's been a trend of ours. We're really excited about. Um, and I didn't separate it out, but as excited as we are for these numbers for our um, population overall, we're extremely excited and proud of the work that we do, again, for our students with disabilities, um, and specifically the graduation rates for those populations. And so with that, we've been working really hard uh, to think about two key initiatives. Um, and so one is academic, and the focus is really on improving career and college readiness outcomes. Um, and what that looks like um, is rebuilding our internship program, right? The, the pandemic really put a stop to a lot of the great work that had started at our high school. Um, we wanna make sure that inside of our internship program, um, yes, we're giving scholars who know that they are college bound the opportunity to engage um, in the workplace, but really prioritizing our scholars who aren't college bound, um, who have decided that is not the route um, that they wanna take to ensure that they have the opportunity and prioritize the opportunities with internships as well as increasing our partnerships um, with trade schools. Um, we also are looking at how we can continue to engage um, scholars around systematic growth from middle school to high school to increase meaningful participation in college readiness and college level courses. We don't want to just tout that we have X percentage of scholars that are taking college readiness courses like Algebra II um, or taking AP classes, but we want those experiences to be meaningful. We want scholars to be able to learn and grow and really be prepared for what a college classroom is going to look and feel like. Um, and then operationally, our second initiative is really around creating a K through 12 unified um, brand. And so in addition to managing the elementary and high school facilities um, project and building sort of a new um, campus for two thirds of our schools, um, it's also improving scholar and teacher retention. Um, those numbers are pretty high for us, um, but there's always work that can be done around this. Um, and so a lot of the work happens granularly in terms of getting a scholar and parents and family and staff focus groups around our uniform and what um, the new changes were going to be and how do we move more towards a dress code that's more um, inclusive 
Um, how do we deal with situations where uh, scholars feel like maybe parts of uh, the way in which our brand is expressed is limiting um, to their ability to express themselves. And so really digging into how do we make sure that the community we serve um, the Bronx, District 11, and then um, more narrowly, our scholars and their families have voice um, and aren't just asking for a seat at the table, but that we are making sure we are providing them that seat at the table um, so that this way they can help us build our brands. Word of mouth has always been um, our, our best way of getting scholars, um, and we want to continue uh, to do that and help, help our families to support us in the partnership that they've already been providing um, in again, seeing the school that they, they can be proud of and that they wanna share um, with their community members as well. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I want to open it up for, if anybody wants um, for questions or comments. Uh, thank you both for uh, your great presentation. Uh, and I also want to allow Lori the opportunity to um, to close us out on the, on the presentation if you'd like. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you both uh, for for presenting. I know it. Um, I know it's all it's it's another thing to to do on top of all of the things that you have uh, to do as school leaders. So really appreciate your time and sharing out um, your work and your efforts. So thank you both so much. So thank you. And again, we'll um, pause for a few questions. If you have any questions, you want to raise your hand or put it in the chat. All right. Well. Again, thank you for the presentation. Thank you all for joining us today. We're gonna to go ahead and wrap up, give you some time back, as they say, uh, for your day. Thank you for joining us today. We, as always, we will post today's recording in the Resource Center on our website. Please reach out to us if you have any questions about the topics discussed or interested in having your school present at one of our monthly webinars. Uh, monthly webinars, of course, are made possible through the contribution and commitment of our member schools. We appreciate the ability to host these forums for the full New York Parks community. If you are not a member of the association, we encourage you to join today by emailing membership at charters at mycharters.net. Thanks again for joining us. See you at the conference. Thank you for the opportunity to share out. We appreciate it.